Michael, uh, you know, when we think of the mafia, a lot of us uh, have these ideas that we've gotten from movies, you know, like The Godfather and, and, and the terminology we've heard. And so, you know, as I've gotten to know you a little bit, you've sort of straightened me out in a few terms on what, what is true and what isn't true. But just to get started, uh, could you tell us the proper way to say forget about it? I've been asked that about a thousand times. So forget about it. That's it. That's pretty good. You did that well. I like that. I mean, people are asking me to write that on the book. There, I say I can say it. I don't know how to spell it. But. What does that mean? Forget about it. Does it have multiple meanings or just one meaning? It means anything. You know, like are we going to eat tonight? Forget about it. You know, is this guy a good guy? Forget about it. He's no good. Yeah, it can mean anything. Now you uh, were raised uh, in what was it, Long Island, New York? Originally Brooklyn, then moved out to Long Island. And yes. your father, Sonny. Uh, was, now is it right to call it the mob or the mafia? What is the real terminology that's used? I mean, actually, there really is no mafia in this country. The mafia exists in Italy. Mm -hmm. In America, it's called La Cosa Nostra. It means this thing of ours, and it's similar organizations, but a little bit different. And my dad in the 1960s was the underboss of the Colombo crime family in New York, one of the five families. Okay, now when you say underboss, uh, it, so there's a boss, there's an underboss, there's captains. Uh, what do those designations mean? There's actually a boss, underboss, capo regime, or captain, and then there's a soldier. And there is a position called consigliere, and Robert Duvall played that role in The Godfather brilliantly, but it was fictional in The Godfather because in order to be a sworn made member of that life, your father must be Italian. Right. You can't become a made man or a good fella, perhaps, good or, fella, right. uh, until, unless you're Italian, correct? Your dad must be Italian, yes. So if you are in, in, in the mob uh, and you're not Italian, you only go so high? And then you're only an associate. You don't take the oath and become a made member. Let's talk about that oath. You took a blood oath. In fact, you've written a book called Blood Covenant, and uh, he quit the mob and lived, and we're glad of that, Michael. And you took a, a blood oath or blood covenant uh, when you w became a made man, right? Yes. Tell us about that. Well, you actually, uh, it's a very solemn ceremony. And for me, it happened on uh, Halloween night, 1975. And there were six of us that night that took the oath. We walked into a room individually. The boss was seated at the head of like a horseshoe configuration. The underboss and the consigliere were to his left and right. And then all the captains who participated were alongside of them. And uh, I walked in front of the boss, uh, held out my hand. He took a knife, cut my finger. Some blood dropped on the floor. This is a blood oath. I cupped my hands. He took a picture of a saint, a Catholic altar card, put it in my hands, and lit it aflame. It didn't hurt. It burned quickly. It was just symbolic. And he said, tonight, Michael Francis, you are being born again into a new life, into La Cosa Nostra. And if you violate what you know about this life or betray your brothers, then you're going to die and burn in hell like the saint is burning in your hands. So this has religious imagery to it as you, as you become a part of a, a culture, a lifestyle, and indeed a family with your own kind of unique worldview, right? The we way have, you see things? Yeah, Pastor. A lot of people think the mob is a business, but it's not a business. It's an entire way of life. We're a whole different subculture of everything else that exists. We have our own rules, our own morality, our own policies. We do business as part of that life, but it's... It's a life that affects family, friends, everybody that's around us. You were so successful. You were earning six to eight million dollars a week at the height of your career. You landed the number 18 spot on Fortune magazine's 50 most wealthy and powerful mafia bosses in the mid 1980s. Did you ever think you'd come crashing down from this? Did you think you would always make it or what? You know, I, you reach a point where, I mean, I had gone to trial five times. Um, I had beaten every case, including uh, Rudy Giuliani in 85, indicted me on a big case and told me that he was putting me away forever if, if I got convicted. And uh, some of my co-defendants got convicted. They got 30 years and up, and I, I was acquitted. I was a lead defendant. I would have been in jail forever. So, you know, I mean, I was making a lot of money. I'm a captain in the family. Got a bunch of guys under me. They were grooming me to be the boss. So honestly, at 31, 32 years old, I felt like I really had it going on, like I was becoming invincible and I can beat any case they bring against me. And that was my mentality at the time. You had a close relationship with your father, who you admired. And uh, one day you were called in uh, with your father to have a meeting with the, the boss. Yeah. And, uh, but yet you were asked to go there separately. Tell us about that. Well, when I was making all this money, you know, the boss is always 
you, you always worry about the people around you. If somebody's getting too powerful, you got to keep them in their place. And uh, there was a story on the street that I might have been making more money than I was turning in, and maybe I was thinking of becoming a boss myself. So the, uh, the talk wasn't good. My dad calls me one day. He says, Mike, we got to go see the boss. Um, I said, okay, let's go. He said, well, we got to do things differently. They want me to come in first, and they want you to come in second. And I was real uncomfortable with that. I said, Dad, no, we're not doing that. I said, we've been down that road. We're not going to let anybody walk us into a room. We go together. And it was the first time, Pastor, that I ever had an argument with my dad. But I felt very strong about this. And he kept saying, no, we can't show fear. we got to go like this. And after a, about an hour, I threw my hands up. I said, Dad, I've been listening to you all my life. I'll do it again, but I'm not happy with it. And um, that night, it was about uh, close to midnight. I had to meet. Uh, the boss, but he was on parole, so we had to meet covertly. He wasn't allowed to associate. And uh, a guy by the name of Jimmy, another captain of the family, picked me up on 18th Avenue in Brooklyn, and he was driving. I'm in the passenger side, and I got somebody sitting behind me. And I'll be honest with you, I wasn't comfortable. Well, you know, in the movies, that's usually when the guy gets whacked, right? Yeah. I mean... Yes. Yeah. So you, did you think that might happen to you? Well, yeah, I mean, and Jimmy started talking to me about the Yankees. Now, I'm a diehard Yankee fan, but I didn't want to hear about them that night. But uh, I was real uncomfortable, yeah. but I didn't want to show any fear. And so I'm sitting there, you know, waiting to get out of the car, hopefully to get out of the car. And we do. We stop in Brooklyn. It was late. And um, I can remember vividly walking out of that car and walking down the basement steps into that house, not knowing if that was going to be the last thing I saw when I opened the door. And I, I mean, I can remember the smells, the sounds, everything. But obviously, I walked in, you know, they grilled me a little bit, and everything was fine. I, I held out my hand, but uh, my dad wasn't there. And then when we left, we got back in the car. I said, now, I, I knew Jimmy all my life. We were both captains. I said, Jimmy, man, I said, that was pretty, you know, heavy in there. I said, if I was in trouble, would you have told me? He says, you know, you held yourself up real good in there. He said, I said, you didn't answer my question. He said, Mike, if it was the other way around, would you have told me? And I thought for a second. I said, no. He said, well, you know, that's the life we chose. And then he said something to me as I was getting out of the car that hit me like the proverbial ton of bricks. He said, you know, Mike, you're not going to want to hear this, but your father did not help you in there tonight. And I was like stunned. I didn't know what to say. And, uh, you know, I started to think about it. And I said, you know, I know what my dad probably did. He didn't go out of his way to hurt me, but he didn't stick up for me. He kind of took the high road and said, hey, I don't know anything my son did. He's handling it all. I don't know what he's doing. So it just made me think that you know, I love my dad so much, and we were so close that if this life can separate father and son, the person I trusted the most in this life, that I realized that I can't trust any human being that much. And later on, the Lord used that to let me understand that I could only put all my trust in him. And um, I mean that. Right. So, okay, so here you are. You're, you're a made man. You're making a lot of money. You've got, well, did you say 500 people working under you? Three, three to 500, you have yeah. Your, you have a jet. You have a helicopter. Yeah. You're successful in that world. And yet, now here you are telling us about your faith in Jesus Christ. How did you get from that lifestyle, from being the prince of the mafia, as you were described, to a follower of Jesus Christ? Well, it certainly wasn't my plan. I had no idea. You know, at that point in time, I'm at the top of my game. I believed in God, but I certainly didn't need God in my life. I wasn't looking for him, wasn't relying on him. And among many things I was doing, I was making movies. And uh, we were making a breakdance movie, shooting it in southern Florida. And we brought 50 professional dancers to dance in the film. I had everybody staying in a hotel in south Florida, the cast and the crew. I'm sitting by the pool one day, minding my own business with a couple of guys. We're having a drink. And... All of a sudden, this beautiful 20-year-old girl gets out of the water. I'm looking at her. She blows me. It was like a Pepsi commercial. Everything went in slow motion to me when I saw her. I said, and I said man, who is this girl? I got a hold of the choreographer. I said, Jeff, is that one of your girls? He said, yes. What's her name? He said, Camille Garcia. I said, bring her over. I want to meet her. I figured, you know, big shot producer, she'll want to meet me. She didn't want to have anything to do with me, right? And I'm, I'm pursuing her, and she's being polite and sweet and all this kind of stuff, and she wouldn't date me. Finally, I get to her one day, and... I'll cut to the chase, make a long story short. She's now my wife of 24 years. Thank you. <laughs> and she eventually, she led me to the Lord. And you know, the main thing, she was a Mexican girl. We didn't have Mexicans back in New York that day. First Mexican I met, I married. I love Mexicans now, but I didn't know them back then. But, uh, yeah, it's funny. You know, the amazing thing, Pastor, is that 
I meet this young girl, and she's a Christian, and she didn't only walk the walk, she talked the talk, and, and she never, she didn't know anything about my life. She was from Anaheim, California. She used to dance in Disneyland. She had no idea about the mob. And um, <laughs> yet I'm falling in love with her. I meet her. Her mother was such a, a strong woman of God, and I'm saying, man, these people are for real. I used to walk in a house. They were on their knees praying for me. I said, what are you doing? I said, go away. You need prayer. I said, oh, I thought they were crazy. It was kind of creepy to me at first, but... Uh, I'm falling in love with this girl, and all of a sudden, she becomes more important to me than the oath that I took, than, than uh, you know, this bond with my father. And it was never on my radar screen ever to walk away from that life, but she had such an impact. It was more for her than for God, but eventually, God used this woman to bring me to, to him. Amen. Thank it's you. fantastic. Thank you. So, no one is beyond the reach of prayer, not even Michael Franzi's. No. And you did end up being indicted and serving time in prison, right? I did. As, as part of my plan to get away from the life, I took a plea on another case, a big racketeering case, 10-year prison sentence, $15 million restitution, and uh, Camille and I got married. I figured I'd move out to the West Coast. Maybe after 10 or 12 years of parole and jail time, you know, the guys in New York would forget about me. But it became very public when I walked away from the life and contract on my life. My dad disowned me. The government was pressuring me to become a witness. So I had about seven or eight years of real rough time and a lot of struggles. And, um, but you know, you know, God just, uh, Pastor, I got to tell you, it's so hard to tell the story now because there's so much to it, but he just navigated a course for me that eventually, I mean, everybody that predicted my death, everybody said I wasn't going to make it. I didn't know if I was going to make it myself, but I realized he had another plan and purpose for me. And this is it, I believe. Amen. Yeah, you're traveling around sharing your story now, aren't you? I am. And I, I, I got to mention this because I, um, I had done five years in prison, came out. I was on parole 13 months, the worst time of my life. FBI kept telling me my life was in danger. They were, you know, I had to move from house to house. There was people out in L.A. looking to hurt me. They were pressuring me to become a witness. I violate my parole, violated my parole. They put me back in prison, tell me you're going away forever. And um, I spent three years in a hole in Lompoc. They kept me locked down. They were afraid I was going to get killed. What is the hole? The hole is segregation, 24-7 lockdown. It's supposed to let you out five hours a week. But they usually come at 3 o'clock in the morning. They say, hey, Francis, you want yard? I said, at 3 o'clock, that's a little bit early for me. Come back at 4, you know. But uh, they don't really get you out. But um, it was during that time that I really challenged God. And I, I understood what surrendering to him meant because I had nowhere else to go. And during that time, I read my Bible inside out, and, and the evidence was there to show me it was truly the Word of God and that Jesus is truly our risen Savior. But one thing I have to mention, aside from reading the Bible and probably 400 books that my wife sent me in, all on Christianity, beginning with Born Again, Chuck Colson's Born Again, I had a Sony Walkman. And every day, okay, for 29 months in a hole, I listened to Pastor Greg. Yes. And I want to tell you this. If I, had met, if I had never met him, his voice was so emblazoned in my head, but <laughs> you had so much to do with leading me to the Lord, because you're the first pastor I ever heard on the, on the radio, and um, you, know, you inspired me so much and motivated me so much and really brought me closer to God. And I want to tell you this, because the pastor is very humble, but it was such an honor and privilege for me to meet him two months ago. And uh, to be here on the stage with you is like an absolute blessing for me, and I, I feel real humbled by it and, and okay. really very blessed. So you got a great man here, let me tell you. Great. Thank you. Did you um, ever think when you were listening to me, I'm going to whack that guy? No. No, but I said, I'm going to whack anybody that tries to get him. That's for sure. <laughs> I like <laughs> that. i kidding, Lord. <laughs> yeah, he's kidding. Okay, you've written a brand new book. I like the title, I'll Make You an Offer You Can't Refuse. Original. Uh, so what is this book about? It's a business book, and basically, when we were in the, uh, in the life, we lived under a, a Machiavellian philosophy. Machiavellian was a 16th century Italian statesman. The end justifies the means. Do anything you have to do to succeed and be successful. And that's the way I operated my life and business back then. And I was so inspired by uh, King Solomon in the book of Proverbs when I was in prison that I realized that you got to act with integrity in this life. you got to operate business with integrity. And the book is kind of a contrast between the two philosophies. I tell a lot of mob stories about my, my business experiences, but hopefully people will realize the right way to do business um, uh, after reading the book. Michael, in closing, 
uh, you know, it's such an amazing story that you have. And I'm reminded uh, of Paul. You know, Paul the Apostle used to be Saul of Tarsus. He was uh, a murderer. He was a, he hunted Christians down. He tortured them, had them executed. Of course, he presided over the death of the first martyr of the church, Stephen. You know, and when he became a believer in Jesus, it was so unexpected that a lot of the Christians didn't think it was true. Oh, there's no way Saul of Tarsus is a Christian, but he was. But you know, I think when Saul said, forgetting the things that are behind and reaching forward to the things that are before, he knew what he was talking about. He had a lot of stuff he needed God's forgiveness for. He had guilt. And we've talked about this, and you've told me that you had a lot of guilt over things that you'd done things that you needed God's forgiveness for. And I guess what I'm asking is, maybe there's someone listening right now that feels that they've done so many bad things God would never forgive them. Or maybe they're stuck in a rut, in a lifestyle, in an addiction that they could never break free from. And yet you are living evidence that anyone can change. So what would you say to a person like that? Well, yeah, Pastor, I believe that, you know, God has a plan and a purpose for every one of us. And I believe that my purpose over the years has been to encourage anybody that is struggling with their life, you know, especially, you know, drug addicts, people in prison, uh, those who have had some serious issues. I mean, I know all about drugs. I had a sister that died of an overdose. My brother was a drug addict for 23 years. And I know when that takes control of your life, you do things that you wouldn't do ordinarily. And I'm not making excuses, but it's true. But what I did for 17 years of my life, I didn't have any kind of issues like that. I did knowingly, and, and even though I knew things were wrong, I did them anyway. And I can tell you this, I guarantee that there's nobody in this room that has done some of the horrible things that I've done in my life. When you're in that life 17 years, you do a lot. And yet, God has seen in His grace and mercy to forgive me, and I really do believe that, and I think that's the message of the Bible. So my story and my encouragement is, I don't care what you've done. No matter how far short you believe you have fallen, no matter what kind of an addiction you have, no matter how bad you think you are, that if God can save somebody like me and turn my life around, and believe me, I did not see this coming. I can't claim any credit for it. Had I been left up to my own, I'd either be dead or in prison for the rest of my life. It's what I deserved and what I earned in my life. And if God can change somebody from within like he did with me, then there's hope for anybody out there. And I want to be an encouragement to everybody out there. You know, somebody on the way out in the last service, he said, Michael, you know, my problem is guilt. And I said, brother, I understand that because I carried that a lot for many, many years. And a pastor said to me when I, I confessed to him, he said, Michael, he said, don't allow Satan to remind you of what God has already forgotten. He knows your heart. You can't pull a scam on him. And that kind of opened me up. And I want to speak to you out there because I talked to a lot of soldiers returning from Iraq and they tell me the same thing. But if you allow the guilt to stand in the way, God can't perform his, his service through you. And so, um, you know, we serve an awesome God. You know, his grace and mercy extends to everybody. And I think we all really need to understand that. And please, use me as an example. And no matter what you've done, don't feel bad. Just hold it up to me and believe me, you're a good person compared to that. So, um, and I believe that's what it's all about. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. God Thank bless you, Thank you very man. much, Pastor. Michael Frenzy. God bless. Thank you. Thank you.